Good morning. I'm Patrick Lewis, the Director of Collections and Research at the Filson Historical Society. So glad that you've joined us for this presentation in our 2021 Biennial Conference, 1946 Reconsidered, the post-World War II Ohio Valley. I'd like to take this opportunity to again thank our event sponsors, the CENS Foundation and an anonymous friend of the Filson. The work of organizing these sessions and following them up with peer-reviewed publications, further study and public conversation would have been impossible without their support. Thank you again for joining us for this morning's presentation on Louisville's Rubbertown neighborhood. Austin C. Hall is a doctoral student at the University of Cincinnati, focusing on three areas of study, North American Nazism, public history, and rural urban development. He completed his undergraduate degrees in English and history from Teal College in Greenville, Pennsylvania, and his MA in history from Miami University. Austin's presentation today represents the culmination of his work this year with the Filson, tracing the history of industry, environmentalism, and activism in Rubbertown. He and I would like to thank Henry Heiser, Cindy Sullivan, and the numerous industry leaders and the archivists at the APCD and Metro Archives for their assistance in completing this project. I'll return to moderate questions after the presentation as time permits. Please join me in welcoming Austin Hall. Hello, everyone. Uh, I would also like to thank the Filson and every single person that uh, helped and assisted with this project. Um, it's been a great summer working on figuring out the history of Rubber Town. So, um, Patrick, if you are ready, uh, go ahead and start sharing the slideshow. So, today I'm going to be presenting a brief history of Rubber Town, the linchpin of World War II, with titans of industry and the fight for environmental justice. Uh, next slide, please. Rubbertown is an industrial complex on the west end of Jefferson County, bounded by on the north by Algonquin Parkway and on the east by Cane Run Road, and on the west by the Ohio River. During World War II, Rubbertown became one of the leading industrial centers of the United States. Next slide, please. Predating the official founding of Rubbertown, the 1937 flood that impacted thousands of families across Louisville caused many to begin postulating about the potentiality for more natural disasters and environmental catastrophes that could continue to occur if the city and its citizens did not attempt to defend and insulate themselves <clears throat> excuse me, from the threat of a rapidly rising Ohio River. The flood claimed many lives and cost many their livelihoods. Yet seemingly every five to 10 years, we interview those who remember the flood, but sometimes we neglect to ask those interviewees about the restoration efforts, the confluence of community organization, governmental aid, and the burgeoning infrastructure, along with the groundwork that laid, which would one day perhaps make Rubber Town the industrial epicenter of the American World War effort. Next slide, please. Through the destruction of a large portion of the city, which you can see here by the flood map, particularly the entire area which would become Rubber Town, citizens and city leaders sought to build back better so that the next flood, the next natural disaster, would not cause an equitable amount of damage. Due to the flood, nearly 70% of the city was underwater, causing over 175,000 citizens to evacuate as the flood water crested the edge of the city. The National Weather Bureau estimated that the damage cost approximately $250 million, which is nearly $9 billion in today's money. Homes underwater and businesses destroyed, the lives of hundreds of people's, uh, the <laughs> hundreds of people's lives were claimed by the water. All of these factors caused the local, state, and federal governments to pour aid into the rescue, restoration, and relief efforts. Thousands of Tennessee Valley Authority workers funded through the New Deal funded into Louis, funneled into Louisville to aid in the Red Cross in relief, to help the citizens of Louisville build back their city, and to help in the conservation effort of building a flood wall so that catastrophic floods did not, once again, consume the city. All told, the city, state, and federal government pumped in over $300 million in order to rebuild the city and fund the creation of a flood wall that would stretch across the most vulnerable miles 
of the Ohio River in an effort to reduce the amount of damage caused by the quote-unquote Great Flood of 1937. Construction of the first flood wall commenced following the cleanup and passage of the Flood Control Act of 1938. Local leaders, along with the help of the federal government's Army Corps of Engineers, set to work in order to ensure that subsequent floods and other potential natural disasters would not affect the city the way the 37 flood did. To date, there are over 26 miles of the earthen flood wall, levees, drainage, pumping systems, and floodgates. We remember the 1937 flood not just because it was the worst natural disaster to hit Louisville in the 20th century, we remember it because of the confluence of conservationists, environmentalists, government agencies, businesses, and local leaderships that set out to solve an issue, an issue for the city of Louisville. Without the combined efforts of these leaders, there would be no flood wall to this day. Next slide, please. Following the devastation of the city after the 1937 flood, citizens of Louisville started to look to rebuild their city in a more productive, secure, and very much a economically prosperous manner. Rubbertown, once completely covered by water, was at this point just a few oil refineries, a damaged partial electrical grid, and a few inlets of rail ranging from Thai Town, which I will explain in a minute, to present-day DuPont Chemical. Starting at the end of World War I, a few oil developers bought up property in what would become Rubber Town. Standard Oil of Kentucky, followed by Aetna Oil and even the Louisville Refinery, erected massive refineries and dispensaries in order to expand operations and control of the American oil market. By the mid-1930s, Standard Oil of Kentucky alone produced over 500,000 barrels of refined oil each year. Next slide, please. This leads us to the Bond brothers, Oscar, George, and James, who created Thai Town. The Bond brothers decided to relocate their railroad Thai creation business from Elizabethtown, Kentucky to Louisville, as they saw a massive investment opportunity in rail, which they believed would become the predominant shipping option of goods such as oil and other equipment throughout the 20th century. After moving the business to Louisville, the Bond brothers set up shop right next to the three oil refineries that needed shipping in order to get their product out to the American consumer. Company towns, communities where the employer or company own a place wherein the workers live, eat, and work, were somewhat common in 1920s America, and the Bond brothers decided to capitalize on this. They built barrack-like structures next to their operation, and thus, Thai Town was born. The Bond brothers then sought partnerships with some of the railroads that they already went through Louisville. While Bond Brothers Inc. did sell rail ties to many of the railroad companies located in or passing through Louisville, they eventually became the major supplier for a large and powerful and influential railroad company, the Louisville and Nashville Railroad, or LNN Rail which would become essential to the coming wartime effort during the Second World War. The Bond brothers helped to build the beginnings of a railway infrastructure vital to the founding development and production of Rubbertown in the coming years. However, there is a specific purpose for the creation of these tracks. Ellen and Railroad and the Bond brothers saw that the land that is Rubbertown today was ripe for development with more and more companies coming into that area. This forethought allowed the l and Railroad and the Bond Brothers to begin mapping out the foundational aspects of Rubbertown, aspects that proved incontrovertibly valuable in the war effort, as well as bringing industry, technology, innovation, and certainly economic prosperity to the city of Louisville. Next slide, please. Even before Pearl Harbor in 1941, businesses and governmental leaders foresaw American involvement in the war due to the passage of the Lend-Lease Act in March 1941, which provided President Roosevelt with virtually unlimited power to aid the Allies while keeping the United States out of the war. Through this act, the United States supplied the Allies with weapons, protective gear, food, vehicles, and planes. 
A modern nation could not hope to defend itself without rubber, though. In fact, according to archival records, quote, a modern nation could not help to defend itself without rubber. The construction of a military airplane used one half ton of rubber. A tank needed about one ton and a battleship, 75 tons. Each person in the military themselves required 32 pounds of rubber for footwear, clothing, and equipment, end quote. The hour of need for synthetic rubber production was upon the United States, and the federal government began scouring the lower 48 in an attempt to find the perfect location with the right amount of materials and a burgeoning workforce looking for jobs at the tail end of the Great Depression. Next slide, please. After Pearl Harbor and the declaration of war, not only in the Pacific, but also in the Atlantic, the federal government had an issue. They had a problem. Japan controlled 90% of the world's rubber repositories, factories, and dispensaries. Much of the rubber production in this era came from rubber trees, mainly located in the South Pacific. In fact, according to historians Albert Botts and Lillian Perlin, in 9th, October of 1941, just before the attack on Pearl Harbor, they published this article, which is titled, quote, Rubber in Our Warring World. Roughly Southeastern Asia, the Pacific Islands, accounted for 94% of the world's rubber, all of it under Japanese influence since the late 1930s. This posed a major problem, not just for the American war effort, but for the allied collective war effort as well. With Japan allied with Mussolini's Italy and Hitler's Germany, the allies became all but cut off from rubber after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Without a supply of rubber, there are no planes, no tanks, no boats, no iconic jeeps, and no American war effort. While these researchers' article got much of the story correct just before the war, they did get one incredibly important detail wrong. They stated, quote, synthetics, it is doubtful that factories could be built fast enough to take care of our needs if the supply were suddenly cut off, end quote. Had they and other researchers been correct? Had the Allied forces not been able to create, distribute, and utilize synthetic rubber, our stockpiles most likely would have dried up within the first year. And the Allies would have lost the war before it even began. Thankfully, they were wrong. Numerous historians, engineers, and governmental officials agree on the four reasons that the federal government chose to turn to Rubbertown as the synthetic rubber manufacturing and wartime developer that it came to be. The United States obviously needed rubber, particularly synthetic rubber, for the war effort. Excuse me. While the need for synthetic rubber grew, the United States governmental officials in constructing the Rubbertown complex realized that there were other issues to sort out before they thought of creating enough synthetic rubber to fund a war. Number one, the United States needed a location far enough inland that the Germans, Italians, and Japanese could not simply bomb the factory. The look, number two, the location of the synthetic rubber factories needed to be near numerous methods of transportation with infrastructure already in place. Number three, the plants had to be in a location with a strong enough and sound enough electrical grid that could withstand the enormous amount of energy that the plants would need to draw in order to run the actual processes. Finally, number four, the plants would need it to be in a location with the natural resources like coal and limestone in order to run the process of making synthetic rubber. These four reasons constituted the issues that the federal government had with finding a location that would satisfy all four of the criteria. That turned out to be Louisville. Rubbertown eventually had all of the answers to these issues. Located right on the Ohio River, protected by a burgeoning flood wall constructed through the combined efforts of conservationists, federal, state, and local government, as well as industrial leaders, Rubbertown's location provided numerous types of transportation for synthetic rubber materials to be shipped in and out, 
barges could make their way up and down the Ohio River, while other materials could be shipped out through the rail system constructed by the Bond Brothers Ties and the l and Rail Steel. Next slide, please. Much of what I have described so far showcases the beginnings of Rubbertown, the raw beginnings of the industrial capital of Louisville, certainly Kentucky, and definitely the country during World War II. Business leaders and titans of industry, such as Pierre S. Dupont, foresaw America's eventual involvement in the war and began buying up property as soon as the Lend-Lease uh, Act was passed. While war gripped much of Europe, Asia, and North Africa in February 1941, the, board, the board of Trade Journals, the preeminent trade journal of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, reported that the Louisville Gas and Electric, or LG&E, planned to construct a massive new electrical grid at Paddy's Run in preparation for burgeoning industrial growth. Now, rubber, now Rubbertown would be outfitted with the electrical infrastructure necessary to operate wartime industries. The following month, the same journal reported that National Carbide, one of the most influential and important industry to Rubbertown's and America's war effort, would build a new calcium carbide plant adjacent to the new power grid. This is incredibly important because the byproduct of National Carbide's process is acetylene, a key component in creating synthetic rubber. By the following month in April 41, the Board of Trade Journals again reported that DuPont and his company decided to build a gigantic synthetic rubber plant using acetylene readily available thanks to National Carbide's new plant. Next slide, please. By June 1941, BF Goodrich announced that it would not only be constructing its own synthetic rubber plant in Akron, but it would be moving and expanding to Rubbertown. Their subsidiary hydrocarbon chemical and rubber company came to Louisville and Rubbertown to benefit from the oil refineries already there in order to make their synthetic rubber out of crude oil. In the same month, Seagram's, the high proof liquor distiller in Louisville, signed an agreement with National Carbide in order to turn their grain into butadiene for the sole purposes of faster production of industrial synthetic rubber. American Distilling Company soon followed suit and the stage was set for the American government to fund the wartime effort and production of synthetic rubber making in Rubbertown. This made Rubbertown one of the epicenters of the American war machine. Each one of these companies landed massive government contracts to aid in the construction of each of their plants in the Rubbertown area. By the end of 1941, the government pushed through further contracts to help with the construction of a second styrolene butadiene plant owned by a consortium of five tire companies known as National Synthetic Rubber. The federal government invested over $92 million in federal aid through the Office of War Production and the Office of Production Management to construct the necessary plants in Rubbertown, the production heart of the American war effort. The only other wartime project comparable to the amount of money invested in Rubbertown was the Manhattan Project, the building of the nuclear bomb. The federal government knew it could not hope to win a war without rubber, so they turned to the industrial titans forging ahead in Rubbertown to aid the allies against the Axis. Upon the entry of the US into the Second World War, industry in Rubbertown commenced production of synthetic rubber to a scale the world had yet to see. By the end of 1941, there were an estimated 38,000 workers employed in Louisville directly related to these industries, which was an 18% spike in worker employment over the previous year. Over the course of the war, that number would grow to just over 80,000 industrial employees in the greater Jefferson County area alone. Combined wages also grew exponentially from roughly $160 million in 1938 to over $368 million by 1943. Rubbertown reached peak production in 1944 producing over 195,000 tons of synthetic rubber. By the end of the war, Rubbertown became not only America's 
top producer of synthetic rubber, but the world's top producer. All told, rubber the Rubber Town Complex pumped out nearly 1 million tons of synthetic rubber over the course of four years. The Rubber Town area, mostly farm trucks up to 1939, changed into a massive campus of rubber plants, oil refineries, and high proof grain liquor, all in an effort to build the American war machines necessary for winning the Second World War. Having won the war, many rubber town employees, frankly, many Americans wondered what was to come next. Next slide, please. Following the conclusion of the war, DuPont, BF Goodrich, and other companies purchased their companies back from the federal government. American Synthetic Rubber purchased the Kentucky Synthetic Rubber Plant in 1955, prompting DuPont and BF Goodrich to secure control of their companies in the same year. After the reacquisition of their companies, each one of the chemical companies understood that innovative processes involving synthetic rubber, along with other chemicals, could in fact make them a significant amount of money in the private market. While continuing its legacy of creating synthetic rubber for products such as tires, the American Synthetic Rubber Company expanded operations in order to create shuttle fuel for NASA missions from the beginnings of the American investment in space exploration. Xeon Chemicals also focused its efforts on the automotive industries, creating gaskets, brake pads, and automobile hoses. Finally, Lubrizol, acquired in 2002, transitioned toward fire prevention and fire extinguishing materials through the usage and manipulation of chlorinated polyvinyl chloride resins and compounds. Other companies transitioned as well. After reacquiring his company from the federal government, DuPont and his investors branched out the company into one of the most successful and recognizable companies to this day, E.I. DuPont de Nemours Company. Over the next half century, DuPont delved into everything from refrigeration, Teflon, and food processing. They also produced performance elastomers for the purpose of creating automotive belts, gloves, shoes, and even scuba suits. In the same way, carbide industries utilized two of their latest and are, excuse me, two of their largest resources, calcium carbide and calcium hydroxide to expand their business operations and include the production of acetylene gas used in everything from metal cutting to beauty products, soil stabilizations for road construction and acid neutralizing reagents. Even LG&E's Patty's Run electrical plant expanded their operations in order to build two natural gas and few oil combustion turbines to meet the peak demands of the Rubbertown complex. Rubbertown saw a, a, a massive spike in companies investing in the area following the war. Many business people saw the success of the wartime production of synthetic rubber and other products related to the war effort, and they wanted in. Throughout the 60s, other chemical companies sought to move into Rubbertown and continue its quote unquote legacy of scientific innovation following the lead of the wartime industrial titans. Next slide, please. Stauffer Chemical Company, headquartered in Connecticut, bought out Columbia Southern Chemical Company and their 265 acres of land located between Camp Crown Road and the Ohio River in order to build an $8 million plant that would work closely with American synthetic rubber toward a new project and claimed it would create a new, more refined synthetic rubber out of polybutadiene and polyisoprenic rubbers. Their joint effort, announced on January 1st, 1960, would eventually falter, however, due to concern over large acrid gas cloud that formed on October 26, 61, over Lake Dreamland, causing the evacuation of over a thousand residents from the area. While Stalfer Chemicals' time in Rubbertown was short-lived, it certainly made an impact as the Lake Dreamland community never recovered from this incident, eventually selling off their collective shares in the properties. This was not the only reason, however, that people began to lose confidence in the resort that used to be Lake Dreamland. 
The resort, created through the damming of Brammer's Run by Ed Hartledge in 1931, recovered from the 37 flood and weathered the storm of World War II. However, by the 60s, much of the rental properties fell into disrepair due to a combination of overly expensive upkeep of the lakefront properties, the lack of a modern sewage system, and publicly paved roads, along with the pollutants from the rubber town factories and a phenomenon known as white flight. Next slide, please. Throughout the mid 50s and 1960s, white flight, the massive exodus of white families from the inner cities to the suburbs, coupled with a governmental practice known as redlining, occurred across America and Louisville was no exception. Redlining, a governmental practice to subvert a 1917 Louisville court case outlawing racial zoning, became the predominant housing tactic used by white populations to defy and deny affordable, decent housing, as well as manageable mortgages to the black and migrant populations throughout Louisville. Excuse me, as far back as the restructuring of the city following the 37 flood, we see that the housing populations right next to the area that would become Rubbertown received a C or D grade, meaning that Rubbertown was built next to the poorest populations of people, as well as minority groups disaffected by years of redlining practices. Much of this disaffected population did not have the opportunity to move away like many of the white population did following the development of the industrial complex due to years of discriminatory practices from local, state, and federal government leadership. By the 1950s, the richer, whiter populations near Rubbertown began their exodus to the suburbs, effectively escaping the polluted areas surrounding the complex. Lake Dreamland is but one example of how, rub uh, of how pollutants from Rubbertown and the area surrounding the complex, combined with housing issues, caused problems for people in and around Rubbertown. Jumping back to the end of World War II, nearly a fourth of the homes in the city were without sewer service. And most of these areas tend to, to be in the C or D red line districts from the 1937 survey. Next slide, please. Eventually, the city government created the Louisville and Jefferson County Metropolitan Sewer District in 1946. That same year, eight states along the Ohio River Valley joined to form an interstate pact to clean up 981 miles of the Ohio River that had essentially turned into an open sewer for industrial waste and byproducts. After years of negotiation with other states, local government, and private industries, construction finally commenced in 1956 to create the $12 million water treatment system. There have been numerous updates to the sewer system throughout the years, projects that aimed and succeeded in bringing in cleaner water and cleaner air as a byproduct. One of the more recent projects is called Project, Ra Project Waterway Improvements Now, or Project WIN, which is described as the MSD on the, on the MSD website as a venture which, quote, includes a series of sewer overflow reduction projects defined in the integrated overflow abatement plan that will be constructed through 2024 at the cost of $1.15 billion, end quote. It is one of the country's most comprehensive plans to overhaul the sewers and continue making our drinking water clean in the Ohio and clear as of, many, of as many pollutants as possible. Next slide, please. Before the conclusion of the war and due to lingering concern over air pollutants potentially harming the citizens of Louisville and particularly Rubbertown, the city of Louisville passed the Smoke Abatement Act in 1945, which essentially created the Air Pollution Control District or APCD, the name the agency took in 1952. Next slide, please. One of the first acts of the APCD was an investigation and survey of West Jefferson County and Rubbertown, which revealed that the air pollutants coming out of Rubbertown were extremely high. This caused another more public investigation into pollutants by the US Department of Public Health Services, which revealed the drastic numbers as well. 
The study showed that toxins were as high as 22 million pounds per month, a staggering number compared to today's rate of less than 5 million pounds annually. annually. While the APCD slowly began to work its way towards regulating air pollution throughout Louisville, other issues emerged causing public outcry against the Rubbertown Industrial Complex. The post-war expansions of chemical companies and in and around Rubbertown brought hundreds of thousands of jobs to the area in the past 80 years since its creation. However, that's not to say that Rubbertown enjoyed a flawless accident record. Next slide, please. There have been numerous industrial accidents that have caused damage and on some cases took the lives of workers within the facilities. On February 25th, 1963, a collapse of the carbide slag pile at National Carbide Plant, which is now the Carbide Graphite Group, caused millions of dollars in property damage and severely injured one person. Just two years later, multiple explosions at the DuPont plant killed 12 people and injured 37 in what is perhaps the most memorable industrial accident in Louisville's collective memory. By the end of the 60s, much of the population in Rubbertown and the surrounding area were predominantly black and migrant populations disaffected by the practices of redlining, white flight of the previous decade, and the air, landfill, and water pollution caused by the industrial complex. This didn't mean, though, that industrial growth in Rubbertown slowed during the 1970s. In fact, even more companies decided that Rubbertown continued to look like a profitable investment for chemical companies. 1971, Borden Chemical broke ground on a new facility just south of the existing plants. They peaked at over $1.7 billion of revenue in 04, just before being bought out by Hexion Chemical Company, which occupies the property today. Next slide, please. The 1970s though, saw the emergence of the environmentalist movement and saw it flourish in the United States. Building on the work of conservationists before them, environmentalist lobbyist groups across the country sought to do something about industrial cities covered in smog with brown rivers and lakes due to pollution from industrial complexes like Rubbertown. While not in Louisville, the Cuyahoga River Fire of 1969 certainly opened the eyes of many across the country to the necessity of legislation regulating industrial pollution. Taking heed from the civil rights er leaders of the 1960s, the environmental activists also fought for reconciliation of racist practices and policies of the previous decades, such as redlining. Across the country, as in Louisville, industrial complexes, some Americans started to understand that environmentalism and racial equality went hand in hand. With the creation of the EPA, or the Environmental Protection Agency, in 1970, the amendments of the Clean Air Act in 63 and the passage of the Clean Water Act in 72, environmental activists began to build on their newfound power throughout the country. This was no different in Rubbertown. Throughout the 70s and 80s, the APCD issued millions of dollars in fines, ranging from individuals guilty of not following the 75 Federal Motor Vehicle Control Program, attempting to lessen carbon emissions to different companies' violations for emitting copious amounts of pollutions into the air, as well as the sewer treatment system. Other issues arose throughout these decades as well, most notably the hazardous landfills such as Lee's Lane and the American Synthetic Rubber Company's 50-acre landfill on Campground Road. While there are numerous issues with landfills throughout the Rubbertown area, Lee's Lane proved to be the landfill which saw the least amount of regulation in the 20 years before the passage of the Clean Water Act. To this day, the cleanup efforts for Lee's Lane cost numerous entities a combined $7 million with numerous efforts from groups such as Trees Louisville to make the area green rather than the toxic wasteland it once was. By the end of the 1980s, the APCD, the EPA, and the local industrial leaders actually worked together in order to lower pollutants emitted into the air and water throughout the Rubbertown area. Next slide, please. Due to stricter regulations agreed upon by the MSD, APCD, and industry leaders, 
Rubbertown did not actually see a, another industrial calamity until 1981. At four in the morning on February 13th, 1981, a large and accidental chemical leak from the Railston Purina plant caused vapors to seep into the sewer system. A spark from a passing motorist ignited the fumes and left multiple craters in its wake, some of them over 20 feet deep. Luckily, this blast did not actually kill anybody, but it did garner national attention, allowing Jefferson County to impose a detailed hazardous waste ordinance. Only four years later though, on August 25th, 1985, an explosion triggered from a welding torch ended up claiming the lives of two workers at the Borden Inc. plant while injuring one more. It would though be into the turn of the century before another significant calamity occurred, this time at Carbide Industries. This most recent tragedy struck the Rubbertown area in the morning hours of March 22nd, 2011. An explosion at Carbide Industries claimed the lives of two employees. Following each of these incidents, investigations by state and local law enforcement, the APCD, the MSD, and journalists provoked outrage and responses from the Rubbertown community writ large. Next slide, please. Spurred on by the efforts of the APCD and responding to the tragic events of the past 30 years, community leaders in Rubbertown began to form committees, working groups, and activist organizations in an effort for the titans of industry to continue cleanup efforts throughout the 90s and well into this century. 30 years ago, the Rubbertown Community Advisory Council formed with a vision that their organization would help, quote, develop a mutual trust between participating chemical companies and the surrounding community in order to improve overall well-being of the area, end quote. Agreements between industrial titans like DuPont, DuPont Chemical and American Synthetic Rubber helped pave the way for this groundbreaking community activist organization. Leaders from the industrial complex have met with representatives from the RCAC for the past 30 years in an effort to reconcile differences between the industry and the effects that the industries have on the community at large. Perhaps inspired by the good work of the RCA scene, another community activist organization sprung up following former President Clinton's 94 executive order that required all federal agencies to make environmental justice a part of their mission. This fell directly in line with the mission and vision of the RCAC, and it sparked more conversation around the idea of environmental justice with regard to Rubbertown. Due to this declaration, calls for environmental justice for the citizens of Rubbertown were finally heard when the Jefferson County Health Department conducted an assessment of environmental issues in Louisville. Upon seeing the 96 preliminary report, nearly 40 separate environmentally related problems, neighborhood restaurants, industrial leaders and interest groups like the RCAC banded together to form the West Jefferson County Community Task Force. Over the existence of the organization, the combined efforts of these groups succeeded in getting the EPA to set up 13 monitors um, throughout the city to measure air quality. In showing the chemical companies the cancer risks that many of the pollutants, which they were just letting into the air, many changes started to happen, including a program called the Strategic Toxic Air Reduction Act, or the STAR program, which was launched in 2004. The STAR program sought to tackle not only the stricter monitoring and regulation of toxic air pollutants released by chemical companies throughout Louisville, but it also sought to be a program that could incentivize, incentivize worker retention at the plants, the satisfaction of local community and disproportionately affected air, uh, areas by the pollutants from those industries, and build on the environmental justice movement gaining more and more steam since the 1980s. While initially controversial, the STAR program is an example of how industrial leadership, governmental regulation, and environmental justice can actually come together to work for a greater good. These changes happened in great part due to the confluence and cooperative efforts of those in the community with industrial leaders. 
Rather than fight the creation of the ACPD and every new regulation that the EPA passed, industrial leaders in Rubbertown, unlike other areas, actually ended up working with things with uh, institutions like the ACPD, the EPA, the West Jefferson County Community Task Force, and the University of Louisville. Engineers actually argue to this day that the old way of polluting rivers and air is not only damaging to the planet, but it is actually also damaging for profits for the company for which they work. This is not at all to say that there is not a monumental task ahead of community and industrial leaders in order to rectify the mistakes of the past. They do. They have that ahead of them. But only through cooperation, innovation, and keep it in mind Clinton's initiative of environmental justice can this happen. Thank you so much for listening to my talk. I very much appreciate it. Well, thanks so much, uh, Austin. That's that's really incredible and gives us a, an absolute ton uh, to think about. Um, I would invite uh, folks to uh, to put questions in the chat. Um, and in fact, we've already uh, got one in here, which I will open up. Um, it says, albeit across the Ohio River on the Indiana side, do you believe the same factors drove development of the DuPont's ammunition powder plant uh, in Charleston? Um, and does, does the existence of this facility over across the river compete with, uh, with Rubbertown for an existing labor force or have any similar environmental or social impacts um, in the region? That's a really great question. Um, a good historian acknowledges when he does not know the, the best answer to, to a question, um, but I would speculate that there are some of the same factors because much of this was driven by the federal government rather than state government. I would hazard a guess that on the Indiana side, much of those would be the same factors. Uh, as far as the second question, I, I just do not know about the, the production uh, of Rubbertown versus the labor force in, in Charlestown, for instance. I do know though that at least during World War II, the production coming out of Rubbertown was the, I believe, second highest. It was certainly the first highest in synthetic rubber by far, but total war production um, that they were the second highest after, I believe, um, a complex in rural New York. Well, I was thinking back, this question reminded me of, of something that came up in, in uh, Jason Krupar's presentation earlier this morning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, about the existence of these, uh, of these um, defense plants, uh, you know, sort of scaring off those who are looking at uh, um, uh, investing in nuclear plants in the region, right? Like they're, they're trying to find sites that are sort of away from each other so that they, they don't overlap and cause these, these labor issues. But then also thinking about the resistance that he noted in the city of Louisville to the location oh, yes. of a nuclear plant here yes. because you know the, the city's already dealt with a lot of these issues mm -hmm. and and is passing legislation at the time you know in the in the late 40s um, to address some of the environmental issues and I wondered if you could talk about that um, you know sort of where is Louisville um, and, you know, in passing these, 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 uh, these smoke abatement acts and those sorts of things sort of on a national scale, we seem pretty early to be doing that, right? Uh, in fact, Louisville is the first. Um, the air pollution control district that was created in Louisville was unprecedented. That, that was not something that anybody had thought up. It was not something that anybody had even considered. In fact, we, we see... Louisville passed this act before the conclusion of the war, and yet we don't see another uh, air pollution control district until 1949 in California. And after that, they people start to realize, oh dear God, our 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 cities are covered in acid. They're they're covered in smog. They're covered in absolutely horrific environmentally and and personal health issues. So Louisville really was unprecedented in that. Certainly there were acts passed beforehand 
uh, that had to do with coal burning and, and trains and stuff like that. But the enactment of a local city government pollution control district was unheard of at that time. Um, Abby uh, asked a question and, and first says thank you for a really uh, thorough and comprehensive talk um, uh, about Rubber Town. And she asked sort of what, what's the, the future looking like um, and, and about, you know, particularly these questions around responsibility and restitution for the, the long-term damage. And I know that, you know, in, in the course of this research, you've engaged with a lot of these community groups who are, who are sort of working through some of those solutions. I wonder if you could talk about, about some of that. Yeah, particularly the Rubbertown Community Advisory Council. Um, the, the people there, I, I must say, are incredible and, and amazing. It, it, it had not occurred to me, in fact, before I started this project, that there was industry, particularly chemical in the chemical industry, that would actually work with things like an advisory council in, in an area surrounding them. We're not there yet. And, and in fact, it is going to take quite literally probably decades in order to rectify some of these issues. That would be my best estimation as to way, as the way to answer that question. There are some things they are doing. Uh, recently, Louisville doubled down on the STAR initiative, which is really actually welcoming to some of the engineers at these, these companies and these plants, which again, was not something I was expecting to find. I was not expecting to hear from engineers that yes, not only is it bad for the environment, it's also bad for our profits that pollutants escape our plants because anything that goes out into the environment is something we can't make money off of. So there's actually economic advantages now um, and federal legislation that hopefully is coming down the pipe and, and, and will be enacted um, that, that are pushing more and more towards environmentalism taking over uh, and, and really helping the citizens of Rubbertown and Louisville. It's going to take a long time. The effects of redlining are seen to this day. Mm -hmm. A, a boundingly seen to this day. So it's going to take decades to rectify that, but that, that would be my best estimation is to answer your question and, and thank you. Uh, yeah, well, and I wanted to, uh, um, to really get into, into this, this idea of, of redlining and residential segregation. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we have this, this understanding in Louisville today of the West End being a shorthand for an African-American neighborhood Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, at the time that, that these plants are being put in here, um, it is, it is a, a, a sort of mixed race working class neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I know, uh, at, it, it, right after the war, my, my grandparents are, are living on, um, 26th street, uh, you know, just North of Parkland and yeah. moving South building, uh, building those suburbs and, and moving a little bit farther South mm -hmm. every year as my grandfather was working on a construction crew, um, you know, creeping out towards PRP. Um, you know, so that the, the neighborhood surrounding um, these plants changes significantly oh, right yes. after the war. Yes. No, it certainly does. In fact, um, before the war, there was something called White Parkland and Black Parkland, which speaks for itself. But by the time that the 1950s roll around, you don't you don't really see white working class people in and around rubber town it is predominantly i think once one uh census survey i looked at was like 93 percent are disaffected redlined african-americans and and race really did play a humongous issue in how rubber town was created and what it is today so yes certainly the the effects of redlining and white flight are, are present and, and able to be seen to this day. Well, I found it again, tying back to the, the conversation from, uh, from Dr. Fupar's presentation earlier today, you know, talking about not wanting to, to expand uh, mm -hmm. a nuclear facility on the east end of Jefferson County, because there was that fear that that would, that would curtail 
um, residential expansion, mm -hmm. which as we know is, is largely, you know, sort of upper middle class white expansion yeah. into the east end of Jefferson County going out towards Oldham County. They didn't want to, anything to do to curtail that. At the same time, it seems like, you know, the, the, the sort of the industrial jobs that are available in Rubbertown sort of pulls at like magnetically yes. pulls and and it's not just rubber town of course it's industrial distilling it's um yeah. it's eventually ge it's eventually the airport it's right all of that stuff that's on the south end is, is pulling that white working class population down into to, to shively and prp mm -hmm. no it, it certainly is i mean that's that's exactly what happened and, and it's not i i don't mean to say that it's unique to rubber town because this happens in basically every city across the mm. country. Um, but what is particularly unique about not wanting the nuclear plant there is it was surprising to me in, in conversations with Dr. Krupar, it was surprising to me that they, that industrial titans, particularly in Rubbertown, didn't want it because that would have been economically prosperous. Mm. But at the same time, what's, what is, forcing them to not put it there is the upper middle class white population saying i want to breathe clean air and we're not going to have this here so that that's it, it's certainly a a humongous factor and and it's something that the uh, the rubber town community advisory committee is working on to and through this day um, shifting gears a little bit, um, Julie asked a really fascinating question, wondering if you could expand a little bit on the production for the space program and NASA. You mentioned that just real briefly. Mm -hmm. So basically what was coming out of Rubbertown essentially was fuel and, um, this isn't the right word, uh, essentially rockets, uh, the, the actual mechanism that will fire the the space shuttle into the air. Those were the two things that were really the major products coming out of Rubbertown at the time. They have since expanded into everything you could possibly think of that NASA might want um, could be and is produced out of Rubbertown and other areas across the country, but particularly Rubbertown, even up to today. Hmm. I was wondering, um, and we touched a little bit uh, about this, um, you know, I don't know in, in our conversations about this mm -hmm. research, it's been really fascinating to sort of compare um, with other industrial cities in the US. You brought up mm -hmm. Cleveland um, as, as an important touch point. I know you're very familiar with Pittsburgh. I wonder if you could, and we don't normally think of, of you know, we think of Louisville as a Southern city and not really tied into, you know, what we now call mm -hmm. the American Rust Belt. But I wondered if you could sort of compare um, some of what's happening in and around Rubbertown with, with some of those other scenes of significant mid-century industrialization? No, no certainly. Um, in fact, although jobs in Rubbertown have waxed and waned throughout its existence, really, um, what we don't see in Rubbertown, which was actually surprising to me, being born and raised north of Pittsburgh, hearing about you know, the, the steel industry and that going overseas and all of this kind of talk, we don't really see any companies leave. Even with the, the creation of the APCD, you see constant expansion in Rubbertown, which was odd to me. Like that was not what I was expecting to find, that there were more and more companies that were coming in, building off of and into Rubbertown. You don't really see that in Pittsburgh. You don't really see that in Cleveland. You'll see industries move out and industries take place. In Rubbertown, it's been almost a constant expansion ever since the war. And it does make me wonder, and I don't have data to back this up, but it does make me wonder if it is because of the specific type of industry that it was rubber, that it was chemical companies, rather than something more physical like steel, if that's why those companies never left. And they ended up cooperating much more so than, than industries across the country. It does make me wonder if that's why they stayed and actually worked with environmental activists, community groups, and federal and local governments. 
Yeah, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense. And that that was actually leading me back to, to one other question that I had. Mm-hmm. Um, and thinking about, you know, all of those those products that, of course, are initially made are, are sort of critical to, to defense, right, mm-hmm. <laughs> to our national ability to fight wars. Um, and, and they continue to be, right? Like those continue to be yeah. industries and products that, that it makes sense for the United States to want to keep production mm-hmm. in-house and not outsource and not sort of, you know. Um, and so I wondered if you could uh, jump back to um, the wartime uh, you know, ownership and operation of these plants. I know uh, in the keynote last night, uh, Dr. Campbell was talking about, you know, the, we had essentially a planned American economy that started in 1942 and, and, um, and centralized lots of ownership and price structuring and all of those sorts mm-hmm. of things. And that's very much the case in Rubbertown, isn't it? Oh, it certainly is. I mean, the, I, I, I hope I didn't mistake this in my talk, but during the war, those companies were owned by the federal government. The, the, it wasn't like it was a government contract. The government actually took over control of those companies and set the prices, set what they were going to sell things for, set what we needed for the war. And it eventually became a, a like other industries across the country, it became this massive amount of worker influence there was there were like I, like I said I think there were eighty eight thousand jobs created in the four years of the war, which at that time in Louisville is a humongous portion that's of the wrong. population. Yeah. Like that that's not something you really see or or expect without a wartime effort. Now after the war, people were worried. Okay, New Deal policies might still be in place, but they're waning what's going to happen to my job? And so what ended up happening was a lot of these companies just kept expanding, although industrial mechanization eventually would take over and some of those jobs would, like I said, wax and wane. It wasn't like the steel industries of Pittsburgh that just up and left. It Mm -hmm. wasn't that the Rust Belt uh, of middle America was all of a sudden just gone. That didn't happen in Rubbertown. That was not what I was expecting to find either, but, but that didn't happen in Rubbertown. And quite honestly, there, there's a lot of money being poured even in, into and through this day into those companies because of their legacies from the war. Mm-hmm. This was really a unique, a unique um, industrial portion of a city and and something i did not really expect to see because it, it bucks the trend yeah well, i mean and and some of the some of that government ownership doesn't go away as soon as the the war is. no no some of those some of those companies were not even bought back until 1960 right um wow. by by 1961 essentially everyone has it, it's all back in private hands but before that, um, I don't even think DuPont was DuPont was bought back in 55. Mm. You know, there, there's a good 10-year decade gap after the war that the government is still setting and regulating prices, setting and regulating the amount of workers. And, you know, that's, that's odd, to, to say the least. It, it, it's odd that that happened when that really didn't happen in many other cities. That's really amazing. And I was thinking back to, again, to Dr. Campbell's uh, presentation last Mm -hmm. night, talking about coming up with the idea for his his book on 1942 in the midst of the 2008 financial crisis, when when options like this are on the table to to save American manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the, the, the scale of the emergency um, you know, in 2008, you know, echoes some of these, these governmental measures that were, mm-hmm. had been in place in the depression and continue on through, uh, through World War II. That's really, really fascinating. Well, and, and quite honestly, rubber town doesn't exist without the new deal. Uh, let's mm-hmm. just, let's just be frank about that. It rubber town does not exist without the new deal and the money and uh, particularly the response of the government after the 37 right. flood. That doesn't happen unless government and industry work together. 
in, in that era in particular. Now, were they concerned about pollutants and all of that? No, quite frankly, they were not. But it doesn't exist to what it is even today trying to rectify those things without the New Deal. Well, fantastic, Austin. Thank you so much. We are right at time and, and I would love to keep going mm -hmm. about this. Thank you so much for this really wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you to everyone who put great questions um, into our chat. Um, join us in a half hour uh, for Richard Bailey um, and his presentation on uh, the, the childhood of uh, Kentucky's uh, 1960s um, countercultural authors. Thank you, Austin. This has been fantastic. Thank you all. I really appreciate it.